In the next two videos, let's talk about Resource Description Framework or RDF. RDF along with property graphs is one of the two popular graph-based data models in the database market. When I talk with graph data practitioners, I often find RDF to be somewhat misunderstood and somewhat harder to get started with than property graphs. Now part of the reason is that the property graph data model is just a data model. In contrast, RDF and the standards around RDF form more than a data model. They form what is known as a knowledge representation and reasoning system. Therefore, the necessary terminology to introduce RDF may sound a bit intimidating at first. For example, if you read up on RDF, you may be bombarded with words like inference, knowledge graphs, ontologies, semantic web, or a set of abbreviations like IRIs, Sparkle, RDF schema, or OWL, which may all be overwhelming. But don't be overwhelmed. My goal in the next two videos is to introduce these terms with very simple examples and also make you appreciate RDF and show you the benefits that you can get from RDF if you choose it as a data model in your applications. I will also make connections between RDF and Symbolic AI and leave you with some interesting parting thoughts about the role that RDF can play in our currently AI dominated world. Before I get started, I want to put in two minor plugs. First is that I have a blog post that covers the material of these two videos, which you can find in the video descriptions. There are references to many good reading you can do on RDF on that blog post, so I highly recommend it. Second is that although Kuzu is not an RDF, but a property graph database with Cypher as its query language, we do have a feature called RDF graphs that automatically maps your RDF data into Kuzu's property graph model. So you can do basic querying of your RDF data or combined querying of your RDF data with your property graph data in Cypher all in Kuzu. We will have a separate video covering Kuzu's RDF graph feature, but do try it out in the meanwhile. So with those two plugs out of the way, let's just get started. Perhaps the most important benefit of RDF as a data model is its ability to model highly complex and irregular domains. Suppose you're working at an e-commerce company like Amazon or Alibaba and you have decided to catalog all of the products sold on the platform in a database so you can support applications like search and question and answering or business reporting and analytics. Suppose you want to be able to answer questions like which size of Levi's 511 jeans are sold on the platform or which screen size of Apple Watch are sold. How many products are there under the loose jeans category? How many are under the jeans category? Which products are subject to the Textile Labeling Act regulations of Canada? To be able to answer these questions, your records need to model your products, the categories of these products, the screen size of some products like watches, the materials used in other products like jeans and t-shirts, while things like publishers and editors in other types of products like books and many, many other properties of these products, such as the regulations that they're subject to. It is certainly a very, very challenging task. Suppose you wanted to use relational modeling for this. Let's just think about modeling one product, the Apple Watch. Would you have a smart watches table or a watches table or a wearable table or an electronics table? The first problem is that many products fall under multiple but different categories. For example, an Apple Watch is a type of smartwatch, it's also a type of a watch, it's also a wearable as well as an electronics product. Whereas another watch, say a Rolex watch, may be a watch and a wearable, but it's not an electronics product. Even if you picked one of these tables, say smartwatches, what would their columns be? Even different smartwatches may have very different sets of properties if they're produced by different producers. For example, some may have four different screen sizes while others one. Some may have 10 different series while others one. Some may be supporting third party applications and multiple operating systems while others don't. And some may be waterproof while others are not. The fundamental problem is that if you're a large enough e-commerce company that sells thousands of products, there will be so much irregularities and complexities across your products that you cannot easily converge on a set of meaningful tables and columns that force you to give a rigid structure to your product catalog. What you need is a more object-oriented or graph-based model that allows you to one, to model your products as a set of objects or nodes, two, 
to be able to put these objects into possibly multiple type or class hierarchies. And three, you want the model to give you the flexibility to have a lot of irregularities about the data that you put into these objects or how objects connect with each other. Such modeling flexibility is a common benefit that you get from graph-based modeling, including modeling with the property graph data model. But RDF arguably gives you the most flexibility in terms of modeling highly complex and irregular domains. Next, let's get more technical and cover the three core components of the RDF data model. First are resources. Resources are your objects or nodes, so they're used to represent the entities in your database, such as your products like Levi's 511 or Apple Watch. But they're also used to represent the schema of your database, such as the types and properties of your entities. So for example, you can have a resource to represent loose genes or genes or watches, or even the concept of size and price, which are not really entities themselves, but they are types and properties of your entities. Now, this is in fact a very important difference between RDF and the property graph model. Recall that in the property graph model, types are labels of nodes, but they are not nodes themselves. So for example, if you wanted to represent device 511 genes and indicate that it's of type loose genes, in the property graph model, you could have a node with label loose genes, but you would not have a separate node to represent the type loose genes. Similarly, in the property graph model, properties are the keys of the key value properties you store on nodes, but they are not nodes themselves. Now, the second thing to know about resources is that each resource is identified with a unique string called an IRI or International Resource Identifier. IRIs are URL-like long strings in your browsers. Uh, they're in the form of a namespace and local ID. So let's suppose that the name of the e-commerce company in our example is Global Corps. To identify the resources related to our company, we could define this namespace, http colon slash slash globalcorps.io blah blah, which I'm simply abbreviating as GC. Using this namespace to identify the resource representing, say, Levi's 511 genes, we could use this long string here, which I'm simply abbreviating as GC column Levi's 511. Now, the specifics of how IRIs look is not really that important. All we need to know about them is that they are unique object identifiers, or you can think of them as the primary keys of your resources. The second component of RDF are literals. Literals are simply data values, so they're strings, integers, or dates that will be used to store the properties of resources. For example, the number 20 or the string foo bar or the date 1st of January 2024 are all examples of literals. Let's next discuss the third component of RDF, namely triples, which is how you actually express information about your resources. In RDF, you express information through simple sentences, as if you're speaking in pure English, and further, using the most elementary sentence structure of English, namely subject, verb, and object. In RDF terminology, these sentences are referred to as subject, predicate, object triples, but predicates are really verbs. So let's take an example. Suppose you wanted to express that Levi's 511 is a type of loose genes. You can do this with the triple GC Levi's 511 RDF type GC loose jeans, or suppose you want to express that Levi's 511 has a price of 20, say in dollars, you can have the triple GC Levi's 511, GC price 20. As these two examples show, triples are simple subject predicate object sentences that express some relationship between a subject, which is always a resource, and an object, which is sometimes a resource, as in GC loose jeans or sometimes a literal, as in 20. Now, one note I want to make before moving on is that in the first RDF triple I used, I used the predicate RDF type, which is a universal or standardized predicate that's used across all RDF datasets to indicate the types of resources, and we will discuss these standardized predicates in detail later on. Now, why is RDF considered a graph-based model? Note that resources can already be interpreted naturally as nodes, and if we further interpret literals as quote-unquote literal nodes, which I'm showing with dashed boxes here, 
then a subject predicate object triple can be interpreted as a directed edge from a resource node to either another resource node or a literal node. Therefore, a set of RDF triples, which is what forms an RDF database, naturally forms a graph as shown in this slide. Let me next highlight the first benefit of RDF, which is how flexible and expressive it is as a data model. Here are three key flexibilities you get when you use RDF as a data model. The first flexibility you get with RDF is that entities can have irregular sets of properties. For example, you can model device 511 to have two sizes in your database while GeneSex has only one size. Similarly, you can make device 511 have two different properties, size and price, while GeneSex has only one property, say only size, even though they're both of type loose genes. The second flexibility you get with RDF is that you can form proper type hierarchies similar to type hierarchies in object-oriented programming. Now, let me get back to the RDF type predicate I had used earlier to indicate that Levi's 511 was of type loose genes with this triple. Now, RDF here is a standardized namespace that stands for HTTP column slash slash dub 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 dot dub three dot org blah 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 RDF dash syntax dash ns. An RDF type is a standardized predicate to indicate the types of resources or entities in RDF datasets. That means that every developer in the world using RDF uses RDF type predicate to indicate the types of their entities. Another standardized predicate in RDF is RDFS subclass of where RDFS stands for another namespace that's shown here. And using RDFS subclass of between your classes or types, you can form proper type hierarchies. For example, you can indicate that loose genes is a subclass of genes and that further genes is a subclass of variables. This allows you to indicate indirect types of your entities. For example, that Levi's 511 is not only of type loose genes, but also indirectly of type genes as well as variables. And the third benefit of RDF that I wanted to highlight is that you can put entities under multiple types or classes under multiple superclasses. For example, you can indicate that smartwatches is not only of a subclass wearables, it's also a subclass of electronics. In the next video, we will discuss in details the benefits of forming these proper type hierarchies. But for now, let's pause and appreciate something very interesting about RDF. Now, one can consider any database of records in any data model to consist of two pieces. The first piece is the metadata information about the database, indicating the types or classes of records there are and the properties of these classes, as well as some general constraints, such as uniqueness constraints across your records. In the database world, we call the metadata information the schema. In the RDF world, you'll hear the word ontology. Further, the second piece of the database are the actual data records that represent actual entities, actual relationships between entities, and actual property values of these entities and relationships. For example, in relational modeling, you could have a loose genes table and indicate that loose genes have name, size, and price properties or columns. That would be the schema information. And further, you could put some tuples into these tables, such as device 511, 32, 20, which would be an actual data record. Further, the query languages of databases often have two separate statements to express or update your schema and your data. For example, in relational modeling, you would have two separate SQL statements to update your schema and your data records. In contrast, in RDF, you model information about your schema and data in a uniform way, namely as triples. So while the triple GC device 511 GC price 20 can be seen as a data triple indicating an actual price of an actual entity device 511 the triples GC device 511 RDF type GC loose genes or GC loose genes RDFS subclass of GC genes can be seen as schema triples indicating the type or class of an entity or a relationship between two classes nonetheless they're all triples further because schema elements such as classes such as loose genes or genes are themselves resources you could also have data triples to express information about schema elements for example you could have the triple gc loose genes gc subject to gc textile labeling act to indicate that products under the loose genes class which is a class of entities 
are subject to the Textile Labeling Act of Canada. To make you appreciate the power of this uniform data and schema modeling, just observe that this is not doable in relational modeling. In relational modeling, different types of entities are often modeled as separate tables. So table names such as students or employees or loose genes can be thought of as representing types in relational modeling. Now, to express the information that loose genes are subject to Textile Labeling Act, you would need a way to express information about the table loose genes in relational modeling, but that's not doable in relational modeling. You could, of course, model loose genes as a tuple in a separate table, say called regulations, say with the tuple loose genes textile labeling act, but then you couldn't join this information or connect this information with the tuples under the loose genes table. Notice that the tuples, for example, Levi's 511, 3220, have no common values with the tuple loose genes textile labeling act. The common value is with the table name of the tuple Levi's 511, 3220, but that's not a way to join records in relational modeling. In contrast, all of these resources and this information is naturally connected in the corresponding RDF database or RDF graph. I will get back to this point momentarily when I discuss how you query your RDF databases. The standard query language of RDF is called Sparkle. As with every other high-level query language, Sparkle is a SQL-like language with familiar constructs such as filters, projections, joins, group by and aggregates. My goal in this video is not to cover the details of Sparkle, so I will just show very basic example queries that will hopefully be self-explanatory to anybody with some basic database query language background. Consider one of the motivating questions from the beginning of this video, which sizes of Levi's 511 are sold? You could simply issue the following Sparkle query that contains only two clauses, select and where to answer this question. As with every other high-level query language, Results of queries are tables of bindings to your projected variables, which are expressed in the select clause in Sparkle. So on our example database, the relevant part of which I'm showing on this slide, there were two triples about the size of Levi's 511 genes. So the result of this query in our example database would contain a table with two tuples, 32 and 34. The important part is the WHERE clause, which is where you express the triple patterns that you want to match in your database. You could also match more complex triple patterns and join your resources with each other in more complex ways. Let's take another one of our motivating questions. Which products are subject to the Textile Labeling Act regulations? You could issue the following Sparkle query, which says, find me all products P that are of type some class C, such that that class C is subject to the Textile Labeling Act. Now suppose this is the relevant part of the database to answer this query. On this database, this query would give all the products under loose genes category because that's the only resource that is subject to the Textile Labeling Act. So the result of this query would contain two tuples, namely GC Levi's 511 and GC Genes X. In fact, let me do something a bit more interesting and extend this example a bit to demonstrate the second benefit of RDF that I wanted to highlight, which is how natural it is to do uniform querying of both your data and schema. Now, because RDF makes it very natural to model both your data and schema in a uniform way, it also makes it very natural to query both your data and schema in a uniform way, namely as triple patterns in the WHERE clause of your Sparkle queries. Now, even the previous example can be considered as doing hybrid data and schema querying, but let me make my case even more obvious with a new example. Suppose, instead of asking for the products that are subject to the Textile Labeling Act, we ask for the sizes of these products. We would add one more triple to our Sparkle query, which would now return back 32, 34, and 36, which are the sizes of Levi's 511 and GenesX in our database. Now, part of this query is querying for sizes of products, so that's clearly querying data records, whereas the other two triples can be thought of as querying schema information in the database because it's asking for information about types of entities and a class of entities, namely loose genes. Now, data and schema querying is not just a feature of Sparkle, it's a feature given by many graph query languages. For example, you can also query both data and schema in the Cypher query language for property graphs, but arguably not as uniformly as in Sparkle. 
With that, let me complete this video which covered the basics of RDF as a data model. In the next video, we'll get into more interesting aspects of RDF and the standards around RDF, such as their ability to facilitate inference and reasoning and justify why RDF and these standards are more than a data model and instead form a knowledge representation and reasoning system. Thank you very much for listening and please subscribe to our channel.